My name is Alan Tullis. I'm a professor in the history department at Emory University and I'm also uh, the co-director of the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship. And perhaps more importantly for today, I, I'm one of the founders along with uh, Catherine Skinner and Martin Halbert of a journal called Southern Spaces that's now been around. We're in our 11th year multimedia peer-reviewed open access journal that began in uh, 2004. So we want to talk about some ideas that we have and some, some of the things we've learned from our experience in doing um, multimedia open access peer-reviewed journals for 10 years and using the, the platforms that uh, we've had some experience with and indeed want to suggest that we could help others who might be interested in launching such journals uh, with uh, platforms and types of software management that are open access and with a large uh, user group to help keep the thing going. But first, let me say a little bit about what makes our center different. We are situated between the library at Emory and the IT side of, of Emory. Uh, in 2011, uh, we uh, received a Mellon grant, the Emory libraries did, to help launch projects that would have to do with putting together faculty and graduate students, particularly, so that graduate students could learn how to do new kinds of digital publishing, work in, work in scholarly publishing. And along with that, soon after that, the library uh, reorganized itself and many of the activities that were in the digital side all came together under this umbrella of the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship that would have included a lot of electronic text work, some of which went back into the early 1990s with uh, several projects that had to do with digitizing collections of electronic text, data management, GIS, uh, map production for projects, uh, and, and ultimately, too, the journal Southern Spaces. All of these were put together in the center. And we now have a staff of about nine or 10 full-time um, people who are c committed by the budget itself. And so, so we have that sense of, of hard commitment from the university and from the IT world to sustain the center. And then we have about 25 or 30 graduate students who work with us, uh, you know, four or five to 20 hours a week. And part of the sustainability model that we are trying to suggest uh, is the use uh, collaboratively between faculty and graduate students and the training of graduate students in how to do digital publishing so that when you're working on journals such as Southern Spaces, you are part of a, a group of, of grad students who actually perform almost all of the processes of editorial review, working with authors, design, layout, and they work their way through uh, as they're in course of study so that some of them have been working with the journal for four or five years and then they move up to more senior management positions. And all of this is a way in which we've uh, persuaded our graduate school at Emory that this is a good investment for graduate students to be trained in this way, that they then can go out and find jobs in, in regular tenure track positions because we have largely humanities students across almost every discipline in the humanities, but also the new uh, alternate academic jobs that are coming up in digital centers and digital projects, libraries, publishing, um, and to try to also reach out for grad students who are in the health sciences and medical world who are also interested in publishing. So that's kind of our large mission. Um, and, and I'll show you a few things about some of the projects that we work on. We have collaborated a lot during the past uh, two years with trying to put together faculty and graduate students as well as librarians as teams to work on particular sorts of of projects. This is our website. You can just find it, Emory Center for Digital Scholarship. Uh, look, we'll look at a couple of kinds of things we do in, in terms of the projects. And then I'll talk a little more about particularly the Southern Spaces experience. There is a page here called Featured Projects, which we hope will connect. Uh, this is one of the journals. Uh, we, we have a range of journals that we're helping faculty support. Uh, some of them are peer-reviewed and some are, are more like op-ed pieces where distinguished faculty from around the country collaborate on pieces. This is one that's called Sacred Matters and it's short 
essays about contemporary broad interpretations of religiosity. Um, and it's, again, run by the de Department of Religion and chaired, uh, whose chair is Gary Latterman, so he's in charge of soliciting, collecting articles. We, the, a lot of the work we do is built upon WordPress sites. We try to use common forms. I know, I know a number of other universities are doing this too. We're also committed to the Drupal platform for a couple of projects, particularly the Southern Spaces project, and we use things like Omeka as well. And the idea is to try to get, when you're creating these projects with faculty and grad students, to get them to a point where then you can essentially turn them over to the department or the program and they can, um, this is one perhaps of my favorite from the recent work we've done, um, they can sort of carry them on. This is the Journal of Humanities and Rehabilitation and I always think that humanities need rehabilitation and, but this is not that sort of a journal, it's a physical therapy journal. And this is a journal in which uh, people are talking and writing and doing video about their experiences in physical therapy. It's put, it's put out by the Department of Physical Therapy, but we help design and build this with our team, and then we kind of turn it over to them, and they find a couple of graduate students and a faculty person who is obsessed with keeping the project going, and that's how these things generally proceed. Another one is called the Georgia Civil Rights Cold Case Project, and this is a project that has to do with going back and recovering uh, the history of unsolved civil rights murders within the state of uh, Georgia. And this is headed up by a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Hank Klebanoff, who wrote a book called The Race Beat, which is about um, covering the civil rights movement. And he uses a team of students, so this is actually taught as a class, and, and this is the, t the students who put it together, Hank and Brett Gadsden is his colleague, and they teach this course Every year, students come in, they work with primary materials and documents, uh, FBI files, uh, forensic evidence, and then they do um, kind of reports and write-ups of what they find. Uh, is it not? Okay. It says I am. Sarah will talk about this uh, site a little later, but we seem to be having trouble getting connected. Is it, it is on there. It is. Yeah. yeah. Is that okay if I just plug in there? Oh, sure. So we'll try while we have things working well. Try the Southern Spaces site. <coughs> and again, this is a journal that began 2004, and we tried to, I guess this is in many ways a talk about the content and searcher platforms, because what drove a lot of our original interest in much of this work is, is the changes in the way in which critical regional studies was, were being done and in which um, video, people working in new forms of media, multimedia projects who were an eth ethnographers or anthropologists would need platforms that suited more of what their work was like and there, there wasn't really a space for this in traditional journals. That's one of the things that I think we've learned if you're going to create a journal, it's helpful to find a niche that's not already covered by something like the Journal of Southern History or the Journal of Southern Religion and the whole move towards the spatial turn in the humanities in which people were really looking at deconstructions of social space uh, as well as questions about uh, 
uh, social justice issues with people like Iris, Mary, and Young. Those were kind of the way in which we were thinking about a journal that had to do with taking apart uh, a very monolithic notion of the South, which many people still have, the U.S. American South, and trying to suggest that the South is not really a region, but a section of the country made up of a lot of regions, and that there was critical regional studies work that could be done, much like here in the Pacific Northwest, people working in parts of the U.S. South trying to find out what's going on in the Carolina Piedmont or the Black Belt or the Delta or different regions within the South. So those were our, our motivations, and then we were trying to find new ways to present the material. So we have uh, peer-reviewed essays, which can be multimedia essays, oftentimes embedded documentary forms within text. Uh, we have usual calls for submission. Right now we're trying to get articles and essays about public health in the <coughs> South. Uh, we also do um, reviews of books, which are getting rarer and rarer to find in publications, and I think we really try to have a high standard of book reviews in the sense that we treat those almost as we do our articles. Since we don't do a lot of book reviews, we try to find the ones that seem to be more about these spatial questions or about questions of social justice within a geographical context. And we have blog posts for people who have something they need to say or events that are going on very quickly that need to be posted and don't go through the peer review process. Uh, and we have ways to bring back content from past years. Uh, one of the notions on the journal is if you've got interesting content that somebody wrote a few years ago, it's probably still, it probably still holds up pretty well. So we try to recycle uh, some of the pieces that might have been done as long ago as eight or ten years if they still seem to be relevant or meaningful. Um, and we could try and see how we go here. This is uh, a piece that we just recently published that combines a lot of these features. It's um, a documentary produced by a number of um, collaborators. Much of the work is collaborative. And it features uh, a story about musicians in Appalachia visiting musicians in Wales, which took place in the 1970s. So we're using archival video footage uh, that was made and reco recorded in both of those locations in the 1970s in order to do some, and here are the filmmakers who are still around, and we can interview them and present the actual footage of uh, Appalachian music meeting Welch music and, and exchange, in exchange. We could try, take a chance and see if our sound works. It would be interesting. <laughs> So basically this was a project done in which a number of musicians who grew up in Appalachia in the coal fields went over to Wales and performed and sang and talked about their experience and then Welch miners came over and talked about the Appalachian, to Appalachian people about the Welch experience. But we have the capacity then to do this kind of uh, archived digital video material, redigitized. So we function in some ways as a kind of uh, multimedia journal that serves for archival purposes as well. Um, and again, much of the work here is done by grad students, although the peer review process is something that we have when we first started the journal. Uh, it was wise uh, advice to get a distinguished editorial board of scholars from around the country who were working on Southern materials. So we have that, and we have an editorial review group, which has grown now to be, I'm sure, close to two or 300 reviewers that we can call on to do the peer review process. So those are pretty important fundamentals for the journal that gives it this kind of legitimacy when people are concerned with tenure and promotion questions. And uh, we also keep up with the you know, visits to the site, who's, who's looking at the material, how long are they on the site, and each year uh, the we generate a letter that goes to the writer to tell them how many visitors they've had and how long people have stayed on and what their uh, pieces have, what kind of track, uh, traffic their pieces have received in, in all of this. So we're moving right now from, this is all done on a, a Drupal 6 um, platform, but we're moving over to Drupal 7. Hopefully by next month we'll have that done. And the idea there is to come up with something uh, 
that we could share something we're calling the scholarly journal, and it would be a, a set of Drup a Drupal distribution, as it's called, that could be shared with other institutions or people who want to do journals using a, the, the Drupal platform. Why go and invent some totally new platform when you've got all this very large user group already working on, on the Drupal platform? So that's something that we'd like to be able to do workshops with, help people learn. Along the way of doing the Southern uh, Spaces Project, we've also had, and I'll close here in a moment, but um, we have a number of things which are on the verge of being e-books, our mo long monograph length um, productions, and some of these we hope to, to actually turn into e-books, but others will live here, and, uh, and along the way um, we produced this project here called the Battle of Atlanta, which really is a monograph length project with a, with a lot of original research. It's kind of the definitive essay now on this battle, which was a major turning point battle, 1864, in which uh, Lincoln's reelection was really uh, assured uh, after this battle. But this includes, you know, you can see how many sections it has. It includes uh, a lot of original paintings, cyclorama materials, videos from the different sites. And along with this, we also created um, a mobile app so you can take the tour of, of 12 stops that go with the Battle of Atlanta. It would look something like this on your, on your phone. And if you, if you uh, go to this site, then you can move through and go to 12 different stops which were, are geolocated, uh, and you can read about those stops. You can look at video about each one uh, and read a text that goes with it. And this is uh, an app that we also can make freely available. We just call this the Open Tour app. And it's, you can make your you know, guide to taco stands or whatever you want to using the Open Tour app. And we're also glad to share this with folks as well. Uh, a couple of other things that are being done as tools, Jesse Carlsborough will talk about the Redux uh, platform. Uh, but maybe that's kind of a general sense of where the ECDS sits and Southern Spaces within it. Um, Sarah Melton is going to talk a little more about um, the Atlanta Studies Project, which is one of these collaborative efforts we have. Sarah is uh, our digital projects coordinator, and then Jesse Carlsberg is, is a Southern Spaces uh, managing editor and a graduate fellow, and he's going to talk a little bit about our uh, publishing uh, platform of digital scholarly editions. That looks better. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yep. And the inevitable mic lowering when you're five one. Alright. I think my slides might have gotten pulled down, so As Dr. Tellis mentioned, my name is Sarah Melton. I am the current uh, Digital Projects Coordinator at the Emory Center for, Digi for Digital Scholarship. I'm also a PhD candidate in our Institute for Liberal Arts. So I come from a kind of hybrid, interdisciplinary, weirdo background where I don't quite fit in anywhere, uh, which is actually perfect for this job. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about an initiative that I've been spearheading for the last year or so, uh, basically ever since I came on board, called the Atlanta Studies Network. Um, so this is a project that is a little different from um, some of the other projects that we've mentioned um, and some of the other projects that we've heard about so far here at the LPC. 
I would also like to apologize for the terrible Yates pun in this session title. That was all me. Uh, as many terrible puns that I can get into one, one session, I, that's kind of my MO. Um, but Atlanta Studies is something akin to a scholarly magazine. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a lot about the reason why we didn't want to start a quote unquote journal. Um, it's, it's kind of a different publication. And I think you'll see that just in, in the form of the site itself. It's also collaborative between institutions and collaborative between uh, parts of Emory libraries and um, the whole university, in fact. So it's, it's very much an initiative that wouldn't exist without multiple partnerships on multiple levels. So I'm gonna focus here on its genesis and also um, on how we see digital publications having the ability to foster this kind of both intra and inter-institutional collaboration. Uh, we talk a lot at the LPC and, and I think in libraries in general about platforms and technologies and preservation and all of these kind of big, big questions that are sometimes I think abstracted out from the people um, who actually work on them and, and make them happen. So I'm gonna kind of bring it down to, to the ground level and focus more on, um, on the people side of things. And so this will be a slightly different focus from, from what we've heard before. So like all great ideas, the Atlanta Studies Network started with beer. And if I can, if anyone can find me this mug, I will be eternally grateful. <laughs> I'm kind of obsessed with it. And it, it really, Atlanta Studies really started in uh, the most informal of ways. My, my predecessor at the center, uh, Stuart Varner, who's now at UNC, wrote his dissertation about um, the city of Atlanta and development since the 1996 Olympics. And he was kind of looking around one day and went, you know, it's weird that Atlanta is a giant city in a giant metropolitan area, and there's sort of no core for studying it. Uh, you know, there's, there's no sort of city initiative, city history project, or, or anything like that. So he called some friends from across the city and they said, hey, why don't we start these kind of meetups at Manuel's Tavern, which if you know anything about Atlanta, is like the Atlanta, it, it's basically, we have an Atlanta History Center, but Manuel's Tavern is like the Atlanta History Center Junior. Uh, it's where Jimmy Carter declared his run for uh, for, his pres for his presidential bid. It's the center of literally basically the headquarters of the Democratic Party. Um, so it has this long standing tradition in Atlanta. And, and so they figured, hey, why not meet there? Um, so they started a series of quarterly meetups, uh, very informal. Anyone who wanted to could you know, come along and join. And they started uh, having presentations pretty informal, um, they just rented out a room in the back, bought everyone some nachos, and you were on your own for beer. And then this started to become a little more crystallized, and Stuart and, and our compatriots said, what if we actually had a symposium? What if we actually turned this into a conference? So we had a little bit of money from a Mellon grant uh, to start off the first conference, which was at the before ECDS was ECDS, our, our Digital Scholarship Center. And we had a great response. And so we thought, well, we should probably keep this going. So Georgia State, from across, uh, across the city, took it on for the second year, which was in 2014. And we started to notice something kind of interesting at that second symposium. About roughly a quarter to a third of our registrants were not coming from universities. And we sort of knew that because uh, people coming to the meetups weren't necessarily from universities, but we thought, hey, this is really something. And we had this idea of formalizing uh, the, the initiative into something that had a, a 
prominent, you know, digital presence. Um, but it was at that point that we said, hey, why don't we start a journal? Which of course is always the, <laughs> the great aha moment. And then we went, wait, no, why don't we not start a journal? Why don't we start something else? Um, because as I mentioned, a, a journal has these connotations and we had such a large non-academic or sort of pseudo-academic audience that we didn't want to box ourselves in. So we rethought that initial assessment and we knew that we had all of this really interesting material to draw from based on the first two symposiums, um, but we didn't want to lose the artists and the activists and the people coming from government institutions and nonprofits who had been really instrumental in starting these first two symposia. In fact, we wanted to encourage accessible writing that anybody who stumbled upon the site could understand and engage with. Uh, so we decided, huh, maybe more like a, a magazine or long form journalism, maybe not a journal. And thus, the Atlanta Studies site was born. Huh. And thus, the Atlanta Studies site was born. <laughs> so it's, it's a WordPress uh, it's, it's on WordPress, uh, it's hosted through ECDS, and it very much doesn't look like a journal. We have a few different sections. We've got um, articles, which we think of as longer form scholarship, um, longer form journalism. They typically run 2,000 to 5,000 words. Uh, we have a blog section, which is, um, shorter takes on things, sometimes personal reflections, uh, sometimes highlighting a project, and we also have a projects and resources section, um, which is really meant to highlight the different projects and data sets and things going on around the city of Atlanta um, that might be hosted at Emory, might be hosted somewhere else. My favorite of these is the Inman Park Squirrel Census which I won't go into now, but you should probably take a look at. Incidentally, this lives at atlantastudies.org. It's a lot easier than the longer URL that it redirects to. As well as a page for our events, uh, this highlights the various meetups that we still have going on and our annual symposium. So, as I mentioned, we're not, we're not a journal, we're not peer reviewed. We are a publication though. And we do have what I call an editorial layer. So we have an editorial board that's made up of scholars and public intellectuals and librarians from across the city and in fact, across the country. We also have an advisory board. Um, also made up of scholars and public intellectuals and librarians from really all over. Um, and their role is not so much to do the kind of day-to-day -day editing and vetting of pieces, but to get us in conversation with places that we might not be otherwise. So you can see we've got someone from Atlanta Magazine on there, um, as well as the Auburn Avenue Research Library, which has a really great wealth of resources about the history of Atlanta and other institutions. The design of the site is, is actually a, a pretty central part of what I think its mission is. Uh, the medium is very much part of the message here. We didn't want people to come to the site and feel like they were going to get a lot of text heavy uh, really difficult to digest pieces. We wanted a really visually engaging site. Um, we wanted lots of large images. Uh, so really something more akin to, as I mentioned, maybe long form journalism than what we associate with scholarly publishing. We're also planning on um, integrating 
the work that we're doing with, uh, with the Atlanta Studies site, with other projects across the city. So not just um, on our projects and resources page, but really featuring them as prominent parts of the site. So one of our first blog posts was all about the Digital Atlanta Geocoder project that we have going on at Emory, which is essentially a 1930s Google Maps of Atlanta. And the project is still under development, uh, but we've been able to do some kind of cool things with it. So this first blog post uh, actually mapped the various locations of black and white cinemas across the city of Atlanta between 1918, 1928, and 1938. Um, the idea here was to look at the segregated landscape of the city and how that had changed, which was data that you can get from a geocoder because in the city atlas where we drew this data from, um, they mention race. Everything's coded by race. So you can see here in particular uh, you've got 1918, which is this very small section of Atlanta um, where you have, I, I think, only one black theater. And then by 1938, we've really zoomed out um, across the metro Atlanta region, and you can see the emergence of um, really a black cultural district in the city just by mapping various cinemas. Uh, so we think this is a really kind of interesting case study for what the geocoder can do. And it's also something that we can tie into Atlanta studies. So we're, we're trying to think of ways to really bring together these projects um, more than just linking out to them. Similarly, um, we're looking at ways to, oh, bless you. Uh, we're looking at ways to integrate a new project that we have called ATL Maps that's currently under development at the center. Uh, this is a really exciting collaborative um, project that started at Georgia State and then came over to Emory for active development. And it will allow for uh, sort of crowdsourced mapping of the city. So we've got, um, we've got for example, uh, a project in here about African American history in the Candler Park neighborhood of Atlanta. And you can see um, we've got a series of, of historical and contemporary map layers. And you can adjust the transparency. So you can overlay the historical and the contemporary. And then you can also drop your own pinpoints that can embed media. Um, and eventually, we will open this up to the public so that people can make their own projects and really play around with these historical um, and, and contemporary layers and, and see what intellectual projects come from that. Uh, it's still under development, but we plan to definitely feature this prominently in various Atlanta Studies pieces and on the Atlanta Studies blog in particular. So to sum up um, the Atlanta Studies ethos, we're very committed to open source software, um, open source platforms. We run on WordPress. Um, as Dr. Tullis mentioned, pretty much all of the projects coming out of the center are freely available up on GitHub. ATL Maps is up on GitHub. You can find it there. Um, this is one of the ways that we think about sustainability is by not only using things, um, pieces of software that are open source, but also putting things back out there uh, for other people to develop and build on. Um, it's very much part of our sustainability model. We also believe very much in community cost sharing. So the symposium is one example of this. It moves from institution to institution, but um, each institution pitches in a little bit every year. Uh, to keep it going. And then finally, and this, this is part of ECDS's mission really, we really believe in public facing scholarship. And I think this is one of the things that I'm, that I'm most proud of at the center. Uh, 
the projects that we support and that we build are very much meant to engage audiences that are not necessarily in the traditional academy. Um, we, we want to build tools and platforms that um, almost anyone can use, or at least an educated public. Uh, we, I think sometimes we get trapped in digital scholarship in building tiny one-off solutions um, for very arcane projects, and there's a time and place for that. Uh, but we've, we've really tried to think about publication as a big tent, big umbrella. And that's part of what Atlanta Studies is trying to do. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Jesse Carlsberg, who is working on a fantastic um, tool of his own that is very much hooked into his own scholarship um, and that I think the center is going to have great success with. So thank you. Hello, I'm just gonna pull up a website. No? <laughs> Great. Uh, so I'm, my name is Jesse Carlsberg. Um, I'm the, the managing editor of Southern Spaces, but um, I'm really going to talk about another project that I'm involved with um, as uh, the lead scholar, a project in the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship, um, which embraces a tool component, which is called Redux, uh, as well as a, uh, a sort of proof of concept series of uh, digital publications called um, 19th and 20th Century Amer American Tune Books and Manuscripts. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this platform Redux, um, which is a, a new platform for annotating and publishing digital critical editions. Uh, and then I'm going to pivot to how Redux fits in with, um, with what Alan Tullis and Sarah Melton have already been talking about, which is uh, ECDS's outlook on um, how to, how to or, or I guess CCDS's approach to sustainable library-led digital publishing. So <coughs> Redux uh, is, a, a, as, as, uh, is the case for the other projects that we've been talking about, it's an open source um, platform. It's currently under development by the, the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship um, in collaboration with our library software development team. So what I'm showing you now is, is public and launched on the web. Um, you can access it at uh, redux.library.emory.edu, um, and you can also find the first two releases on GitHub, um, but we're presently in the middle of our third of four currently planned releases, and we think that we'll have uh, everything up and public by uh, May or so. Uh, so what you're seeing now is the public version. There's a test version that incorporates some more recent material. Um, <coughs> The, what Redux is, is it's an interface for creating digital critical editions uh, where the user experience is centered on the, the digitized works page images. So there's many different tools for digital critical editions out there. There's many digital critical editions. Most of them uh, focus on TEI encoded text, which is a good thing. Um, and your reading experience is centered on a display of that text. There's, uh, our contention is that there's a whole class of, of works where um, what's important from the scholar's perspective, uh, or of primary importance perhaps, or even, or at least equal importance, is the, the, the original book's page image itself. And there could be many reasons for that. Um, there might be important illustrations on the text. It might be that the typography, or the paper dimensions, or the book block, or anything like that, um, has, has uh, importance for the scholarly endeavor, um, in my case. Uh, I'm working with musical texts, so and, and, and in particular musical texts using a somewhat unconventional notation system, so the display of that music notation system is really key. Um, so we were, we were looking for a way to present digital critical editions that center the user's experience around browsing those page images. Uh, we want to, to foreground the page images, but we also want to pair that with uh, TEI encoded text, uh, to enable full in-text search. We want that TEI encoded text to be tagged to page regions um, on, the, on the display of the image so that as you're searching for text, you view it highlighted as you would, as you would in something like Google Books, where it's right in the background of the text and the image you're browsing. Um, and then <clears throat> we want, of course, to be able to annotate um, those page images. So 
Redux's annotation and publishing functionality is built upon an interface, um, and in this case, we actually had a, a project that had been under development in the past at our center that um, had been picked up and dropped and picked up and dropped that we were able to harness um, that was really around building a new reading environment for books and other materials in Emory's uh, digital repository. So the, the, I guess the, the base level functionality that we've started with and what's currently um, available online uh, is, is these are a number of collections that just went through Emory's digitization program. You can see that there's quite a number of volumes in here. A number of these collections have um, several hundred volumes. Um, one of the largest collections that Emory's focused on for a long time are these, these um, sort of cheap yellowback novels. What pe as, as you can see here, what people read on the train in the late 19th century. Um, and if you are looking for something to read on your way home, and uh, go no further than Redux and find yourself a yellowback. But um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, 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 the reading side, the kind of base level functionality that Redux enables um, is that all of these, all of these uh, here are, are items that were digitized as PDFs, um, and you could access them just through, libraries, uh, through Emory's library catalog online, or you can access them in Redux. Uh, and you see here there's volume level access. I can view the PDF, I can download the PDF. Um, in the case uh, that there's OCR uh, done as a part of the digitization process, which is the case for most of the volumes, you can see you can also send the text to Voyant, so you could actually perform some um, some fun text analysis on any of these objects just right out of the box. Uh, for a subset, and we're presently working to increase the number of volumes for which this is true, that there's, um, uh, that there's an additional set of, of files created during the digitization process where, um, uh, where we have individual files for the different pages. Then you can also have page level access within Redux. So here's, um, Here's Ladies First, which I assume is an excellent novel. Haven't read it. Uh, and in addition to browsing as a PDF, browsing the full volume, we can also just bring up this page view uh, feature where I can browse back and forth. If I click this button here, I'll be able to zoom in. Uh, and there's not much need to, whoops, to zoom in on this particular thing. But if I wanted to, if I really wanted to see what this guy's mustache was like, I could. Uh, for, for a lot of the other texts, um, there's really a lot to be gained uh, in zooming in on certain features of illustrations and things of that nature. And we also think that uh, for scholars who are annotating books in Redux, this zoom feature is an important way to ensure real precision um, in how the annotations tag different elements of a page. So we have this base level reading experience, um, which I think is, is, is potentially useful in general, and, and this is, is really, in a way, keyed to Emory's repository, but this code base by itself is something that others may be interested in adapting, um, and it's already available, so you can take a look at, at this code if you'd like on GitHub. Um, <clears throat> the next stage, which is what's currently under development, is the multimedia annotation aspect. So we imagine that a scholar such as myself would be in Redux with a text um, that they're planning on annotating through some, you know, uh, scholarly project, scholarly publishing project, um, and you'll be able to, to select little regions of text and then annotate it with multimedia. So in addition to text, um, you, can, you can embed multimedia such as audio, you can add images in there, you could embed video. Uh, you can also include references in your annotations, which the way that we're setting it up, um, the references will sort of generate a, a, a list um, of, um, of all of the references that are annotated within a given volume. It's not just entered as text, it, it references sort of an entity. Uh, and then things like tags, there may be cases where you wish to, to, to draw a connection between a number of annotations and we have a tagging feature that'll enable you to do that. And then once you've finished annotating your volume, which could take quite a while, um, you can then export the images as well as the annotations in a web embeddable format, uh, which where they can then be paired with additional materials such as an introduction or other things of that nature. So this project was designed with publishing digital editions in mind, um, but there's also other uses. As you can see, there's, there's an interface here where really um, you may just want to use this for reading, um, for browsing objects in a digital repository. It's also a way 
uh, our goal is to, to give people a tool where they can annotate texts with the goal of publishing critical editions. Well, you could also just use this for your own research purposes to annotate a text that's, uh, say you're doing work on yellowbacks. You could annotate yellowbacks as you go along and compile uh, a set of research notes for yourself. And we think there's probably interesting applications in teaching too. You could imagine um, giving students an assignment to either individually or collectively um, annotate texts or portions of texts. So that's a little bit about Redux. I want to pivot now to how um, this fits in with ECDS's larger approach to publishing. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit as well about our proof of concept series of editions that will kick off our, our, our use of this project. So th as, as, as I think you've probably already gotten a sense, this is, this is one of a number of uh, publishing platforms, open source publishing platforms that ECDS is helping to develop. Um, and our, our interest is really finding niches, finding spaces in the scholarly publishing landscape where there's something that our scholars really want to do, but there's not a readily available tool. So something like the, the Open Tor app, which um, Alan Tullis gave us a little peek at, is, 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 a, is something that could be potentially useful for any of a number of scholars' projects. You could imagine someone writing a book where they want to have um, a, a, an Open Tor app-driven uh, map to accompany a chapter. Um, something like that was, was one area. Uh, and our, our Drupal scholarly journal platform is another um, situation like that. In, in this case, you know, the critical edition is a real venerable scholarly form. Um, it's something that has been around for hundreds and maybe thousands of years. Um, but it's a form where we think that, that digital publishing offers real opportunities. There's a challenge in printed critical editions of uh, trying to do a lot with limited real estate, right? Yeah, you could hypothetically make a very, very large book, but probably you want to keep it sized down. And then you're faced with a trade-off. You have uh, original material from the book that you're trying to uh, annotate with, a, with, an, with um, critical commentary. Um, and then you have that critical commentary itself, and it has to, those, those things have to share space. So the approach that you often see is um, that the text is, is re-laid out, it's not a facsimile, and there's maybe this much text and then a whole lot of annotation. Um, and that's fine. Uh, if you want to preserve the facsimile of the original text, then suddenly you're faced with a challenge finding space for enough annotations on a page. And this is, a, th this is an area where those, those problems just dematerialize uh, on the web. We can um, layer annotations over the, uh, the facsimile or the digitized page image. So it just strikes us as um, an opportunity to, to, to create a format where uh, digital editions more fully represent both the digitized texts and their scholarly interpretation in a way that's easier to navigate than um, printed books tend to be. Uh, and also we get to take advantage of things like the web's capacity for multimedia and hypertext. And then another thing that we were looking at down the road for this project is a, a standard problem in creating a critical edition is that you have, say, 28 different printings or editions of a given work, and you have to select one, right, and, and, and say that this is the authoritative text. Well, it could be the case that it's your authoritative text for your purposes as an editor, but that a good portion of your readership would really like to see a different edition. Or it could be that what's really compelling to you as a scholar is the connections and the changes among editions. So the tagging feature that we're building into the current version of Redux, we anticipate um, that in time we could develop this feature to, um, to grant us the capacity to link regions of different editions annotated within the system. So you could potentially represent in a critical edition in a way that would be really challenging to do in print the shifts that uh, a given book goes through over time. So uh, just a word about the, uh, the series of proof, proof of concept editions using the Redux tool that I'm working on, uh, which again is called 19th and 20th Century American Tune Books and Music Manuscripts. Um, and I can, can show you a book cover, but the actual uh, page level access is currently on our test site, so we can't drill in. 
There we are. <coughs> Uh, so we're working on, on this set of, uh, of music books, generally for sacred singing, that were published between the late 19th and the early to mid 20th century. Um, these are, are books that use something called shape note music notation, um, where instead of if you've ever looked at music and all of the notes are round, sometimes with little stems coming out of them, um, here the notes have different shapes, which corresponds to their pitch and also corresponds to syllable. It's an interesting method de developed around 1800 to make it easy uh, easier to learn how to read music. And so right off the bat, you have something there that's visual um, and important to represent in an addition um, that, that led us in the direction of facsimile. So uh, I'm, I'm editing, uh, and, and I should say, I made a very poor decision. I chose to annotate this 1911 tune book, which has 550 pages of music. <laughs> There's a, a lot of these books are, you know, fewer than 200 pages long, but whoops. So. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm working on this, uh, this book. We've printed, uh, and, and sometimes what we're doing, you know, for this book in particular, there's a large number of people who sing out of a contemporary edition of this songbook, uh, some of them right here in Portland, and there's actually a market for a print facsimile edition. So we've published a facsimile edition with a critical introduction without annotations, and we anticipate doing that for select volumes in this series. Uh, in some cases, there's a real role for a complementary print and digital component. Um, someone will want to, to hold the book in their hand to perhaps even sing out of it with others, um, but may also want to, to really dig into the history of the volume. Uh, so I'm at work annotating this volume. We anticipate publishing it in uh, 2016. Additional volumes will feature uh, different bibliographic forms. You can see this is an oblong book. Um, so that actually poses a lot of interface challenges for um, displaying the edition online. An upright book will pose different interface challenges. So my interest as a scholar is uh, finding volume editors to um, annotate and critically interpret a range of books, everything ranging from these shape note books to early gospel song books to collections of spirituals uh, to some denominational hymn books as well as some manuscripts, um, people's manuscript collections of music that perhaps give a sense of, of, um, of, a, of a more ordinary, in a way, um, engagement with the material in this corpus rather than the, the sort of exceptional volumes that made it to print with large print runs. Um, but uh, each of these different books with its different features also I think will give us as we're developing and continuing to, to, to brainstorm new functionality to add to Redux, uh, gives us different challenges uh, that we can use to increase the adaptability of the platform and improve its functionality uh, and improve its suitability for critical editions for a range of texts. And we see this work, uh, the, the, the reason for doing this particular set of texts is that um, within Emory, uh, we have a, a library called the Pitts Theology Library, which actually has a, a world-renowned collection of books um, in, in this uh, particular area, but also across time. So we've picked a, a particular range of time, but um, Emory's English and American um, hymnody and psalmody collection is the, the second largest outside of the Library of Congress. So it's an exemplary collection um, that, at the moment, is, is we think underutilized. And this work, just incorporating, just um, digitizing and bringing these volumes into Redux, opens them up and enhances their value by making them more accessible to readers. Uh, but we also think that subjecting them to scholarly, sustained scholarly interpretation opens them up even more. So part of our, our motivation at Emory for working on this particular series is that it it expands access to a key holding of our library. Uh, the series also prompts us to develop some aspects of an, uh, uh, of an editorial apparatus that are a little new for a university like Emory that doesn't have a scholarly press. Um, we've developed an editorial board and editorial reviewers for Southern Spaces, for, um, and Sarah was explaining the, the editorial rap apparatus that, that is cohering around Atlanta Studies. Um, well, we're faced with, with a complementary a different set of challenges in putting together an editorial board, identifying volume editors, coming up with a review process for this series. Um, and with the potential of pairing print with digital volumes, there's also opportunities for partnerships with perhaps uh, institutions that have a built-in editorial apparatus. But that's something that, again, um, we feel like builds our capacity at the center to handle um, the review of a wider variety of publications, which is something important as we increasingly engage in library publishing. So the, the, the final way in which I'd say this fits in with our publishing strategy 
is that it's, it's, it's another contribution that we think that we can make at our center to the broader landscape of library scholarly publishing, uh, where we see that Redux is potentially a tool that others might wish to adapt, even just for, for, for improving the reading experience of digitized objects in a, in a digital repository, but also potentially that it might be a tool that other institutions could adapt to engage in the uh, editing and publishing of scholarly editions. Um, so that's, that's basically what I had uh, to say. I think that we have about uh, 15 to 20 minutes left, so I think we would be happy to any, any of the three of us to, to entertain some questions.